Welcome to 192. We are recording this. Um, I thought that today I would try to finish up um, some kind of a primer on figure sculpture, uh, the history of figure sculpture, with what's going on in contemporary uh, life here in the world, in, in contemporary figure sculpture, especially dealing with the nude. So um, I'm playing a little bit with the modern era of the 20th century, but you know, the 20th century did not have a lot of time for the figure. The, the modern era was so interested in abstraction that they kind of blasted the figure out of the water for about 80 years. And then it came back into its own in the postmodern period in the 1990s and 2000s. And so in the 21st century, now we have a beautiful kind of plurality where people are doing everything that they want to do. They want to abstract and be expressive. They can do that stuff. And people who are doing the figure are doing wonderful figurative work that is um, uh, profound and taken seriously by the art world again. So there's all of that. I took attendance while you guys were all chiming in and everything today. Is there any are there any questions um, that you get? Oh, Aurora? Oh, yeah, you're here. I'm here. Okay. Uh, I, I got back earlier than I thought I would be. So. Okay. Well, good. All right. Because I didn't give you a check mark. So now you're here. Ha. All right. Fantastic. So without any further ado, I'm just going to jump into this. So I'm going to go to share screen. Please. Um, yell out if something bad happens and you, you can't see what I'm doing or that kind of thing. Because once I leave you and go into my own little screen share thing, I'm not always so sure that you're all there and that you followed me into the, the sacred space. So here we go, share screen. Okay, and so I'm gonna share this screen and then I gotta go all the way up to the beginning and start my thing. And I've got 30 slides in this thing and nobody wants to see 30 slides. So some of these we're gonna go through pretty darn fast. But, you know, we dealt with, um, you know, ancient Greece. Um, and then we dealt with what happened, you know, from the middle ages through the Renaissance, the Baroque and the 19th century last time. And so I wanted to do something on modern and contemporary figure sculpture. And these are two separate and totally different things, modern and contemporary. Let me see if I can get this thing to work. Okay. So but we think of the 20th century kind of beginning with their years, I don't know, 1880 or so. As the, as the beginning of the modern age. So that by the early 20th century, the 1900s, the 19 teens, we are definitely in the modern age, the 20th century. We've got all kinds of inventions uh, happening, lots of tech happening in the early part of the 20th century. Um, telecommunications is getting going with telegraph and then telephone. And radio comes into its own in the 1920s and transportation is going gangbusters, going from steam locomotives to electron, uh, electric um, uh, trolley cars and then to buses and automobiles in the 20th century. And, you know, it's just, it's an amazing time. So um, sculptors and artists are uh, responding to all of the tech, the high tech changes and stuff. Here's some, here's a guy named Umberto Boccioni. And this is a fantastic sculpture that we always see in art history classes called Unique Forms of Continuity in Space from 1913. This is a cast bronze piece. And so Boccioni is, is uh, an Italian sculptor thought of as part of the futurist movement. Um, lots of new little distinct movements and isms happening in the 20th century. Um, uh, you know, we've got cubism, and we've got uh, several other movements and futurism is sort of kind of a movement that's kind of happening on the side. And so the futurists are doing this thing. So this looks like a striding figure, a human figure, but that it's kind of moving through space and time. We don't know whether it's got um, uh, clothing that is billowing on it or whether it is just rattling and rippling space time as it is striding and moving but we get a sense of speed and movement and it's just it's kind of an amazing bunch of semi-organic and semi-fluid forms in this striding sculpture 
This guy was so on track to be a fantastic, fabulous sculptor. And then, of course, his brief career ended abruptly when he was killed in World War I. As so many young people, young artists were killed um, in the trenches of World War I in Europe. And so this is the only slide I've got to show you about Bocciani. And we move forward. Gaston Lachaise um, didn't get killed in World War I. Um, he um, met um, a woman that became his wife and uh, model and pretty much lifelong muse, Isabel Nagel. And so his sculpture is characterized by these um, wonderful um, portraits kind of of Isabel. Um, this is a classic one that's in all the art history books, um, Standing Woman from 1917. And she's this marvelous mixture of delicate balance and powerful form. Um, <coughs> almost a modern fertility goddess. Um, she swells and undulates with an elegant strength and poise. She perches delicately on her tiptoes, seeming nearly to levitate despite her evident weight. So this, is, this has always been just a marvelous sculpture because it plays with both mass and strength and power and also kind of weightlessness and grace and poise all at the same time. And so just an incredible, um, wonderful sculpture from the early part of the 20th century. And uh, I think I don't have another little chase piece. We got to move on here to see other stuff. Um, I'm skipping forward into the postmodern age now because the 1920s and 30s, 40s and 50s and 60s were all a wasteland of, you know, in, in terms of the human figure because um, abstraction in its various forms uh, just completely dominated what was going on in the, in the modern age in the 20th century. But by the 1980s and 90s, um, artists were starting to be taken seriously again for doing the human figure and in sculpture. And this is just one of many uh, that I just chose. I kind of liked his work and so I thought I'd throw it up here. Wolfgang Alexander Kossuth is a German sculptor of the 1980s. He died in 2008 and he was ex interested in kind of gestures inspired by balance, by ballet and modern dance. And some of them get to be kind of extreme gestures. And so this is one of them. I got to backspace one and see if the other sculpture, nope. Okay, so this is the first slide of his stuff. So this is Serena from 1994, uh, possibly a dancer, and in kind of a pensive, um, crouching pose. Um, it's really wonderful to see the fingers not quite touching or just barely touching the deck. So that's really, there are three points of contact, the two feet, the balls of the two feet, and then the, the fingertips of the left hand and the right hand is is above the deck there so we've got three points of contact as sculptors we need to know about geometry that three points constitute a plane and that's pretty much all you need to become a stable sculpture so those three points of contact centered underneath the weight of the sculpture give you a really nice um, balance uh, for the sculpture um, oh here's something called Contortionist from 1990. And I thought this was just really super interesting piece. This is cast in bronze and he did several pieces with uh, uh, both male and female contortionists. And I didn't even know if this was real or if this was something that was kind of like his um, uh, twisted imagination and possibly inspired by a contortionist. But anyway, you can kind of see that everything is cantilevered off of the off of one foot with um, the other foot kind of wrapped back around and over the shoulder. I don't know how that works. And maybe it doesn't actually work. I love the fact that she's given us the finger because that's really fun. So, you know, it's always nice when your sculpture kind of flips you off too, because that, that the, then the sculpture has attitude. Um, here's a male dancer um, from the late 1990s, and I just love all the angles and all the triangles created by, um, you know, the arm over the top of the head with all of those negative spaces being created and implied. The other triangle of the other arm um, 
that's going over the, the knee that's tucked in. And the triangle is something we couldn't see unless we were standing up and then looking down on the triangle created by the lower arm. But then there's a triangle created by the knee crossing over or the leg crossing over the top of the other leg. And just it's just a ma marvelous bunch of angles and triangles. Uh, I've, I love this kind of stuff because I always like to uh, twist my models into pretzels and see what kind of forms I could make um, out of a dancer or uh, an athlete who has you know lots of wonderful flexibility and musculature and can twist themselves into pretzels. So I, I really love this kind of thing. Unfortunately, we won't be able to do this because our model has to be able to hold the pose for three weeks while we're trying to sculpt it. But this is really good for you know, um, inspiring you guys. Um, here's something um, called Daphne and Apollo from 2002. And if you know the uh, myth, the Greek myth of Daphne and Apollo, Daphne is a wood nymph um, uh, in the forest and Apollo wants to um, uh, catch her and, you know, have sex with her, make love to her, whatever. And she's wanting to get away because this is not a desired thing by her. And so as he grabs her, she turns into a tree. And so she um, sprouts, you know, branches and leaves and everything out of her limbs. And then her torso and legs become a, um, a tree. And so this is the instant that um, Apollo is trying to grab her and take her and then the, she, is, you know, out of protection is transforming into a tree. So that's the Greek myth um, that he is exploring here with a couple of dancers and kind of a modern dance motif. Um, changing gears here to Ron Muick, uh, rhymes with Buick, Ron Muick. Um, um, I saw this piece at the uh, Smithsonian's Hirschhorn Sculpture Museum about 20 years or so. So I was gonna place the date on this around the year 2000. Um, the woman that's pictured in the picture is an actual um, attendee and looking at the sculpture so that you can see that the sculpture is way over life size. It's a monumental piece. Um, Muick plays with this three-way tension that he loves to play with between the naturalistic forms and coloration and the proportions that are slightly off kilter. You see this guy's arms are kind of short and his you know, torso is kind of short on top and really long in the bottom half of his torso. And then his legs are longer than his arms. They don't kind of belong on the same body. So he's playing around with um, uh, weird proportions uh, on his uh, figure sculpture. And then finally, facial expressions that are just weird. You know, facial expressions that add a sense of irony or annoyance or just um, some kind of off-putting uh, thing that just um, uh, does not make you comfortable when you're looking at this or comfortable in the space with the sculpture. And so it's really kind of cool. This is called Big Man. This one is a Ron Muick piece called Pregnant Woman. And she is larger than life size, just a little bit larger than life size. And so um, again, it makes you feel a little bit intimidated because of this much larger than life size person. The belly is even bigger than a, a pregnant woman's belly would actually be. And so it, he has, you know, the proportion is a little bit exaggerated here. And uh, it, it makes a profound, huge thing. He's putting hair on these things, um, working with um, uh, polyester resins and silicone rubbers and all kinds of textures and everything to try to make these things as lifelike as possible. There's been a huge movement in the postmodern age to do super realistic, ultra realistic sculptures that are made out of um, soft, uh, skin materials and lots and lots of paint and individual hairs inserted into individual uh, follicle, you know, places um, on, the, on the body to create these illusions that this sculpture is a living person. And I do have a that... question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, so would these be like based in ceramic and then covered in silicones or is it like fully made out of like the Silicone, do you know anything about their construction? Sure. Um, you, 
there's lots that goes into it. Uh, usually you weld up with a rebar, a steel armature to hold up the okay. clay and then cover the steel armature with maybe styrofoam or some other kind of soft uh, material because you really only wanna deal with about two inches thick of clay um, on the outside surface that you're actually sculpting. So he kind of has to plan out the armature very carefully to be sure that it's contained within the outside edges of the sculpture. Then he lays it up with clay, uh, probably an oil clay, uh, because people don't even use water clay anymore, and sculpts the thing and then takes a huge mold off of it, multiple pieces. This might be a 20 piece mold uh, to uh, get all of these pieces and parts. And then that is cast in resins and um, all kinds of you know, stuff like that. It's probably cast in um, fiberglass, polyester resin and, and put together. And then the skin is probably painted on as a silicone uh, gel kind of thing over the top. And then the hairs and the painted skin and everything else is added afterwards. That's so it's amazing. a really, it's a long laborious process. Go ahead, Aurora. I just said, that's amazing. Thank you for answering that question. Yeah, and so a lot of these are gonna be like that. Um, this one is even larger over life size. This is a bunch of people in attendance here looking at this piece, again, in a major museum kind of a space with about a 20 foot tall ceiling. And so we've got this boy. And you know, it, not only is he in kind of a classic boy crouch, but then he's got that strange, menacing, weird expression in his eyes and face um, that just is kind of strange. The ear is super big. We've got this re really, you know, kind of over life, not just over life size, but out of proportion kind of ear and um, eyes and stuff uh, for the boy. So it's it, really interesting. Um, and, you know, Muick is just one of these guys that makes these huge monumental pieces that um, just are so shocking to behold. Here's a baby from 2006. And again, this baby is five meters long. So, you know, that's, um, that's 25 or 30 feet long um, as this kind of newborn baby. Um, and it just, it's very strange to see something enlarged that big and yet not perfectly enlarged. It's got its, it's, got its challenges and problems in terms of um, some of the uh, proportions, but it's just, it's still a super striking thing. Um, so I'm gonna change away from Muick for a while. I found a bronze sculptor that was kind of just doing straight up figure sculpture, sculpture that I liked. So Brian Booth Craig, he's a con very contemporary sculptor. He's working right now um, casting uh, bronze figurative stuff in the late um, 19 teen, or 20 teens and early 2020s. So he is working right now. He works mostly with female figures that are confident, powerful, and yet still are part of a traditional approach to the mythos spiritual transcendence of the human figure. He approaches the human figure a lot like I do. When I'm doing my sculptures, you know, I do it out of an uh, immense amount of respect for the um, mostly female um, models that I'm working with. Um, I'm trying to show them, you know, in, um, you know, all of their power and, uh, uh, you know, self-assuredness and everything else. And yet at the same time, I, I want to feel like I'm part of a sculpture tradition. So um, I'm interested in, um, you know, the sensuality of the form and all of that. So, and I'm a, I'm a bronze caster. So I really appreciate the idea of cast bronze sculpture. This shows you what you can do with cast bronze that you can't do with any other material um, with metals and then um, a metal armature inside the bronze casting. This would be welded stainless steel um, rod stock that goes up inside of this thing to create a skeleton, you can cantilever the piece off of one point of contact. And so there is definitely a one inch thick piece of stainless steel solid rod stock that goes up from the wrist through the arm and then distributes the weight up above so that bronze, which is 99% copper and quite soft, will actually still be structurally sound as a sculpture executed like this. Um, kind of spectacular pose. Uh, not a pose that anybody could really hold, 
and yet a wonderful pose nonetheless. But otherwise, you know, we have these just confident, self-assured um, portraits for the most part with a certain elegance to them. And, you know, I love this one. I love these when we get the hair kind of playing a role, a formal role, um, some kind of hair form thing where the hair dances, flows, moves, is kind of fun and really interesting. And so I'm hoping that you guys can see that um, dealing with the nude is just a lot more than some dealing with a naked body, that we, we work with power and that there's a certain her heroism, a certain heroic quality, a spiritual transcendence that's possible with the human figure. And I know that's you know asking a lot out of you guys, and I don't expect anybody to do that. I just want you to know that we are professionals. We're treating this with a seriousness of purpose, and that there are all kinds of cool things that we can express with the nude human figure. Um, Patricia Piccini, um, I ran across her, and I just think these are the strangest little sculptures ever. Um, she's from Australia. She's an Australian person. Uh, she has this really interesting kind of fantasy approach to figure um, where she uh, marries up um, human characteristics, human facial features, human fingers and human toes with these various kinds of, I don't know, marsupials, I think, because, you know, she's from the land down under. So she's, you know, probably responding to lots of different kinds of things that we don't see in North America. Um, so she's got a real interest in biology. But when she's making these things with, um, you know, soft fleshy parts and all of these hairs, human hairs and um, uh, bristles and things like that, it gets to be quite strange. What's interesting is that she does not have a mean scary bone in her body. She looks at these things with a fascination and, you know, also thinks that if we if we approach the grotesque with an open heart, that um, these can just be fun, uh, fantasy, fantastical kinds of things that we could, you know, be amused with and um, be happy with, even if these were alive and they were our little friends or our little pets or our little friend pets. Um, so, um, you know. <sighs> There's this guy named Graham and, you know, she laughs about this guy being, you know, kind of built for Australian uh, highways um, because it looks like he could just about survive anything. And, you know, Graham, I don't know, he has no neck. So, you know, his head goes right into his shoulders, but then he has, you know, multiple breast forms running down both sides of his um, rib cage. Um, interesting concept kind of sort of here. Um, here is a, a photograph of the artist herself. Patricia is in the foreground and behind her is an installation of one of her pieces that she calls the welcome guest. And so, you know, both the child is one of her sculptures. So it's a figurative sculpture as a child um, standing in her own child bed. And then here's the, you know, happy, playful little, um, you know, mutant that the child is not uh, afraid of. It's not a monster. The child is, um, it, it's, it's embracing the child and showing all kinds of um, compassion and warmth and empathy. And the child is, is showing that just directly back. And so it's this open hearted view of biology and kind of mutations, possible mutations in biology that Patricia is um, really interested in which I find fascinating because it, I am you know, put off by the grotesque, but other people are not. Well, let's see, there's, um, some, there's some stuff in the chats. I'm gonna go see if I can see any chat stuff from here, if I gotta stop and look. I'm gonna stop the share for just a second, check in with you guys and see if you're all okay. And I'm looking at the, all the cool stuff. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay, and is there anybody who wanted to make a comment or anything? I'm going to go right back to my screen share here. Those okay. were some weird, um, the, the, I think those are all weird. <laughs> They're cool and weird at the same time. Yes. Well, and the idea that, you know, um, fingernails could morph into some kind of paddle type form here. Um, and all of it, it's non-threatening. It's non-sexual. Um, 
it's like it's cuddly and cute, but in a grotesque, cuddly, cute kind of way. It just, it's all over the place for me and my kind of sensibilities. Um, that, that is like right up my alley. This is okay. the weird, obscure, creepy, but cool. Uh, I don't know. I love it. So here's one from 2012 that she did as a self-portrait. So this is her standing as a self-portrait as a sculpture and holding this little um, child piglet thingy. And there are um, aspects of her own portrait that are really strong in the face of the creature that she's holding and caressing. Um, through the eyes, through the nose, and through the lips, um, she shares the same um, portrait, you know, um, uh, characteristics and proportions, facial facial features with the um, the creature that she's holding. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it is really weird, fascinating, interesting, and I'm glad that some of you are super interested in it. I'm a little wigged out by it, but you know, it's still I'm trying to wrap my head around it, and I could probably warm up to this, you know, if I spent some more time with it. Okay, I want to move on to a guy named Sam Jinx um, that I found. Um, he's, again, uh, most of these people are playing with super realism, you know, um, uh, super realistic fe features that are not life-sized. And so I stole this from Getty Images, and that's why it's got that little uh, imprint on the photograph. But I liked this version of it because it had an installer or the artist or somebody who was a life-size real person with a tape measure to give you a sense of the scale of the piece. So it's really strange walking up to this because this seems like a very strange, intimate um, pose. And these people have real hair installed on their heads and soft skin and all of, all of the realism, super realism that you could possibly want, but they're only like 40 inches tall or 36 inches tall or something, which makes the, the change in scale you know, miniaturizing it down from human scale makes it a really strange and arresting piece when you see it in the, in the gallery. Um, the same thing goes for this. This piece is smaller than life size. So you come in and you see this miniature uh, woman crouching on the, <coughs> on the pedestal, kneeling woman. And she, you know, um, is probably uh, less than two feet in length. Uh, if she were to stand up, she might be a three foot tall or a three and a half foot tall person uh, with perfect human proportions, um, but th this crouching figure. And you can see the hair is backlit in the photograph. Um, so, I mean, and, you know, you can see the uh, translucent quality of the ear cartilage and the light shining through the ear cartilage. So that kind of attention to detail and materials to try to get that sense of fleshiness is really fascinating. Um, Sam Jenks, same guy. I want you guys to try to remember the Pieta that we saw that Michelangelo did um, back when he was 20 years old, uh, but you know, carved marble. And then it's the same concept of, um, uh, you know, a, a, the dead figure in the lap of the person. Um, this feels a lot more like father and son, or, you know, possibly even grandfather and son, uh, kind of that kind of, not only mortality, but a little bit of morbidity too, that we have to confront as part of one of the uh, hard truths of life. And so, you know, that artistic tension is on full display in this homage to uh, Michelangelo's Pieta. Um, I thought this one was particularly difficult to deal with, uh, Hanging Man from 2007. Um, once again, the, the male figure is slightly smaller than life size. And so this is a real person um, looking at it in the museum or gallery photograph um, so that we can get a, a sense of the scale of the piece itself. And so this limp, lifeless, possibly no, not lifeless, because I think there is a sense of life in the person, but super uncomfortable idea of hanging from um, two um, pegs underneath your armpits is just awful. Um, and 
you know, it kind of harkens back to uh, the crucifixion. And so it's sort of a, you know, modern day crucifixion kind of a concept. So we have to deal with, um, with that piece of um, cruelty and inhumanity in this piece. Uh, moving on to another guy who's also doing um, hyper-realistic figures. He calls them Zarko. Zarko Bashevsky um, is a uh, Macedonian artist. So he's from um, north of Greece. Um, Macedonia is one of the breakout uh, republics from the um, um, all of the stuff that fell out from um, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain and all of the, you know, the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia kind of breaking up and uh, Yugoslavia breaking up and all of that. Um, so anyway, he's from that part of the world. Bashevsky uses these hyper-realistic figures in strangely unexpected poses and movements. So he's got this guy who is way over life-size. This is about an eight foot tall sculpture when you walk up to it. And it has the appearance that he is breaking through the floor from down below because of the fragmenting of the actual gallery floor around his waist right there. And it's called Ordinary Man. This one, you know, again, hearkening back to the David and Goliaths that we were seeing in the Italian Renaissance. Um, here we have another David and Goliath from 2015. Um, David, uh, you know, I guess is a young boy. I don't know. He's got some fairly developed musculature for being um, a, an adolescent boy. He's, you know, quite awfully buff, you know, through the... Um, uh, pectoral muscles and uh, uh, oh, what are the shoulder muscles called? I can't remember now. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But I'm I'm wondering who that poor um, uh, older man, older male uh, head figure is down there that's supposed to be Goliath. Um, maybe it's his former sculpture teacher. We'll never know, I guess. Um, uh, Bashevsky takes some huge risks here um, with his Mars and Venus. Um, he made these two figures that are based, I think, on people um, with dwarfism. And so, um, but they are uh, very large uh, figures, monumental in scale, so that um, these are about eight to 10 foot tall figures, and you'd walk up and you would be dwarfed by them. And uh, so he's making kind of a super interesting um, commentary, especially, you know, giving them the, um, the Roman god names of Mars and Venus, uh, Mars, the god of war, and Venus, the goddess of love for ancient Rome. Um, interesting juxtaposition there, intention created in the compositions. Finally, I know you guys were looking for finally. I've got a couple of pieces by an artist named Kara Walker. Um, she's a British artist, and this is a, an installation in the, in the Tate Gallery, the Tate Museum. Um, um, it's uh, an addition to the Tate in uh, London that is an old uh, power station that has had all the turbines taken out of it. So this is a huge hall that's at least 40 or 50 feet tall. And it allows um, monumental sculptors to do installation pieces here on a truly monumental scale where they wouldn't fit any place else. And so Walker, as you can see, is of African descent. And she is really interested in stereotype imagery and kind of reworking stereotyped imagery from history as um, monuments, as monuments that celebrate um, um, Africans um, instead of um, uh, just wallowing in, um, uh, I guess, the suffering and pain that Africans have had to deal with for 400 years, um, you know, dealing with uh, European uh, culture with um, uh, With, uh, with slavery and all of that. So this fountain that she's made, she's got a figure up on top of the fountain that is spouting water. 
out of her two nipples from her breast forms and then also a water spout that's coming out of her mouth. It's a, it's a figure that's nude to the waist and then has drapery from the waist down. And I'm going to go to that um, for a close-up. And so it's kind of a combination of a stereotype of a, uh, uh, how an African uh, female may have been depicted by, um, you know, white artists, you know, um, drawing caricatures or cartoons or something like that. But it's also in the style of the um, uh, the Venus de Milo uh, that we saw from ancient Greece. So we've got the idea of both the Greek monument of beauty of probably the most famous and most beautiful sculpture in um, Western civilization uh, kind of put together with um, uh, black stereotype kinds of uh, imagery here. And so it's troubling, it's playful, it, it challenges us to, to deal with this. And of course she's dealing with it in a white color, um, trying to refer to the idea of marble. Uh, again, uh, this, this really special material that um, all of the Western cultures like to play with in terms of really serious sculpture um, and architecture uh, done in white marble. And so I'm just gonna pull back once to see the rest of this because we've got lots of other imagery in here that harkens back to um, different approaches to um, stereotypical imagery uh, uh, dealing with um, the black experience uh, over the last five, four or 500 years. Um, the last project goes back to 2014, another Carol Walker sculpture. And she did this um, in New York, I think New York City at the Domino Sugar Factory. Again, a huge industrial space. And she sculpted this um, Sphinx out of sugar. This is the, the name of this piece is A Subtlety or The Marvelous Sugar Baby. And so again, you can kind of see now um, how she's playing with the stereotype of African facial features in this kind of head that's on top of a sphinx. And a sphinx goes all the way back to ancient Egypt. So you know, we've got the great sphinx um, that's part of our artistic heritage. And here she has created a great sphinx out of sugar in a sugar factory. And so it's got the kind of the, the mammy face with the, with the head wrap, uh, head scarf um, tied in front. And I'm gonna show you the side view of it. This is the side view of it. So it really has that Sphinx quality that goes all the way back to the great Sphinx of ancient Egypt. But the idea that it's done in a closed abandoned sugar factory made out of sugar and that sugar cane and the sugar industry was one of those commodities that the slave trade that um, cheap labor you know, provided by enslaved people um, it was the only thing that could make that possible in the new world in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. So she is making a huge comment about that cultural significance. And it's just really, she's a genius. When you hear Kara Walker talk, she is an absolutely wonderful person, um, powerful intellect, and just a really cool person. So I thought I'd just want to share some of her work because it's way a little bit outside the box from just the kind of contemporary um, naturalistic representational figure stuff that I um, wanted to show you today. But this is a really important artist who's doing really important work right now on a world scale. That's my um, last, yeah? I just wanted to say uh, she does a lot of, Kara Walker does a lot of interviews and she talks a lot about her work and what she had behind like the meaning of it. Um, and with the uh, a subtlety, the Sphinx figure around it, she had casted in actual sugar, um, like hardened sugar. She had casted a bunch of smaller children um, out of just sugar. And they, um, they melted as the exhibit went on. And it was a really, really cool thing to learn about. But she does a lot of really interesting interviews talking about her work as well. Oh, I am so glad you know about her. That's wonderful. And yeah, she is just, she's an amazing person. 
I'm trying to see in this photograph if any of that stuff is, is visible, but I think this is still part of the installation. So um, there's still um, workers working on the project and stuff, but that's her in front of the sculpture. Yeah, that's it. So I'm gonna uh, stop my screen share for today and come back to you guys. Oh, hello. So, you know, in, th in three days, we kind of, you know, had to do something while we were marking time, waiting for uh, our ability to start working together. So we took a little trip down Sculpture Lane and looked at a history of figure sculpture in Western civilization. And we didn't even scratch the surface, but it, gets, it gives you lots and lots of ideas about how your work if you see yourself as an artist and sculptor, can um, you know can start here at, from a, as a point of departure, and then you can take it anywhere you want to go. My hope with um, working with from the human figure is that you know we're probably going to do just some, some kind of basic, um, um, very uh, portrait-like you know human figure study. Hopefully, trying to just learn the forms and proportions. Of the, of the model that we're working with. So you may think that it's kind of perfunctory and kind of prosaic, but it's a start. It gets you started in the, in the process. Um, I see by the old clock on the wall that it's about quarter to two. We've been at this for about 45 minutes. So if you guys have any questions or comments, um, please feel free to unmute those mics and just chime right in. And otherwise, I'm gonna wrap it up pretty soon today. Uh oh, there's a download coming in into the chat. I don't know how you did that, but um, there's something in the chat that I have to try to download. Oh, it's downloading to my system. Um, I can't open it. I would like to open it. Aurora, did you send that? I don't know where this download came from. Um, yes, I said that. I was trying to send just the image file, but it apparently didn't work. But um, it was of the molasses children, basically. Yes. Okay. I did see some of them in other photographs of her work. So they were like fountains. I saw one that was, you know, a Venus de Milo or a uh, David or something like that. Um, so she was trying to make some connections to other pieces, monumental pieces from, um, uh, you know, art history from Western art too, which I thought was really cool. Um, McLean has his uh, mic open. Did you want to give us a, a comment, sir? Oh, yeah. Are we still meeting at one when it's in person? Yeah, we're still meeting at one when it's in person. So I want to invite you guys to come over here at one o'clock on Tuesday. And we're going to try to meet and do something. We might try to rough out a sculpture, but at least I wanted to give, give you guys a taste of what the studio is like. We're going to meet in Eden 3. And I guess I'm going to prop open the doors that are, you know, in the lobby of Eden Hall. So there are double doors in the lobby and we'll just come right through the lobby and we'll go into Eden Hall number three. It's the uh, painting and drawing studio. I want you guys to wear COVID masks. Everybody must be masked up for this class. And so make sure you've got a good mask that fits you well and that you, know, you can wear comfortably. And we're gonna get come in and just get kind of used to the space. We may not stay long, it might be an hour, but at least um, you'll get a taste of it. And then hopefully I'll get somebody hired by Thursday so that we can start sculpting in, um, in earnest. So with that, I think I'm gonna wrap it up for today. Thank you all so much for putting up with all of this. And I'm really looking forward to making some good sculpture with you starting next week. Have a good Martin Luther King Day and a good hol uh, holiday weekend. And I will see you guys next week. So goodbye for now.